Hi, I'm Sean Campbell. And I'm Brian Lowe. And we studied the effect of altitude simulation on aerobic capacity and pulmonary function. Before we start our presentation, we would just like to thank Palm Beach Atlantic University. Uh, without the QI grant that we received, we would not have been able to do our research. We also would like to thank Jamie Gash and Dr. Mitchell for helping us at key points during our research. So this is the elevation mask uh, 2.0 that we used. So as you can see, there are three, point, uh, three ports on the mask. And in each port, there is a flux valve. Now, that is just this little rubber piece. And depending on how you put it in each port, that either allows air in or allows air to be ex um, expired. So we set it up so the two ports on the outside is how you breathe in, and then the port in the middle is how you breathe out. Uh, it comes with three additional caps so that you can change uh, the elevation. So the breathing system is going to reduce the airflow in, which then is going to encourage you to take deeper and much fuller breaths. Um, so this elevation training mask claims to do a few different things, which will lead to an increased overall performance for um, each athlete. The first thing it claims to do is condition the lungs by creating pulmonary resistance. Um, the second thing being um, it claims to increase the surface area and elasticity in the alveoli. Um, the alveoli is where the gas exchange occurs within the lungs, so this will help aid in um, the oxygen absorption. Um, it also claims to increase the lung capacity and oxygen efficiency, as well as strengthen the diaphragm, which is the, way, which is the main muscle used in breathing. So as with any other muscle in the body, um, we expect that if it gets bigger and stronger, that it, then it would be more efficient at its task. So we looked at a couple other studies. So the first study was completed by Prakari, and he studied the effect of wearing the elevation training mask on aerobic capacity, lung function, and some hematological variables. So they had a total of 24 subjects, 12 in the experimental group, and then 12 in the control, control group. It was a six week long study, uh, and they completed high intensity cycle ergometer training. They found no significant uh, changes in pulmonary function. They did find significant improvements in VO2 max, which is aerobic capacity, in both of the groups. So they concluded that the mask is more just of a respiratory trainer than it is an, al uh, an altitude simulator. So another study we looked at was done by Maher and Figueroa, and it was entitled um, The Effects of Simulated Altitude Training. Um, on aerobic capacity and function. And so this study had a total of 14 subjects, seven which used the mask and seven control subjects. Um, so what they did was they had their subjects train for a period of six weeks and they trained two times per week um, for 15 minutes at 65 to 75% of their heart rate reserve. Um, what they found was a significant difference in the maximum voluntary ventilation between the two groups and they also found slight non-significant um, increases in the VO2 peak within just the mass group. So now moving on to our study, we had a total of 14 subjects. We had eight in the experimental group and then six in the control group. We would have liked to have 10 subjects in each group. However, due to dropouts and just willingness to participate, we were not able to get to that number. Um, so they were males and females, ages ranging from 19 to 22 years old. Um, when they came in, we took down their basic characteristics. So that included their height, their weight, and then their percent body fat. After we did that, we just kind of sat down and talked to them what we expected of them to participate in our study. So they would need, each group would need to exercise 90 to 120 minutes a week. We chose that because they're college students, so they don't have all the time in the world, and 90 to 120 minutes would allow three to four times a week, 30 minute sessions. After that, the experimental group, we gave them the mask. So the mask, as I said earlier, comes with three caps. So we took away two of the caps because we did not want them to change the altitude to either make it easier or harder. We set the mask to 6,000 uh, feet. We decided on that because Denver, Colorado is about the same. 6,000 feet equates to about 1.13 miles above sea level. And we know that many athletes go to Denver, Colorado to train. So if we can have our subjects train at that same altitude, then hopefully we could get some similar results. Um, so once they had it, they just continued their training. So um, we did three different tests, both before and after the eight weeks of um, training, so we could compare the results. The first set of tests we did were pulmonary function tests. Um, the second was a measurement of the diaphragm wall thickness using ultrasound. And the final test we did was a direct calorimetry assessment of ventilator measures. So the direct calorimetry assessment. So 
we had our subjects come in and there is a metabolic cart and that's going to measure the ventilation, measures oxygen, and then carbon dioxide of your expired air. So as you can see, he is wearing a blue mask. So we fitted each subject with that blue mask. Once we had it on, we made sure that no air was leaking. So we just had them breathe out with force to make sure there was no air leaking out. So all expired air was going through the metabolic cart. On the front of the treadmill, there is a perceived exertion scale. We had them each minute point. So it ranges from six to 20, six being extremely easy, 20 being maximum effort. So each minute would say, like, show us where you are, and they would point to where they thought they were. And then, so the, for this test, it was a graded exercise test. So that means that each minute is going to change. So for our subjects, we set it starting at three miles an hour with no grade. Every minute we would increase the mile per hour and then the grade, so making it harder and harder. They were instructed to go as long as they could. So when they were done, they just hopped on the sides, we took everything off, and the test was done. During the test, we were looking at their RER, which is the respiratory exchange ratio. So that is the ratio between the amount of carbon dioxide that you are exhaling versus the amount of oxygen you are inhaling. When an RER hits one, you know that the subject can only go for maybe one or two minutes longer because at that point, you are exhaling more carbon dioxide than you are inhaling oxygen. So as you see here, VO2 and VCO2 are listed twice. That's because the top one is going to be your absolute VO2. And we are more interested in relative VO2 because that takes into account a person's weight. We, were also, we also looked at the anabolic threshold. So anabolic threshold is the point at which your body is making more lactic acid than can be taken away. Uh, we thought that was interesting because the mass claims to prolong the onset of anabolic threshold. So we wanted to see if that would prolong it. So in order to do the pulmonary function testing, we used a spirometer, which is the picture you see on the top right. And we used two different types of tests, the flow volume loop maneuver and a maximum voluntary ventilation maneuver. Um, so when a subject came in for testing, first thing we had them do was take a seat and we instructed them to sit up straight um, with good posture. Next, we um, gave them a nose clamp, which would go on their nose, and we instructed them um, to make a tight seal um, around the spirometer, which would go on their mouth. Both of these would ensure that no air would escape and it would all go directly into the spirometer. So first thing we did was the flow volume loop maneuver. For this, um, we instructed them to just get the spirometer in their mouth, um, and whenever they were ready, they would just begin taking a few normal breaths, and then when they felt ready, they could inspire as um, hard and as fast as they could, and then expire as hard and as fast as they could, as if they were trying to blow out a candle from across the room. Um, from this flow volume loop maneuver, we get the first four um, measurements you see here, the FVC, which is the forced vital capacity. That is the amount of air that can be expired forcibly after a full inspiration. The FEV1 is the amount of um, air that can be ex expired forcibly in the first second. Um, FEF max, the max expiratory flow rate, that's the fastest flow at any point um, during an expiration. FEF mid is the mid expiratory flow rate, so the flow rate within the middle portion of an expiration. Um, so after the flow volume loop maneuver, we moved on to the maximum voluntary ventilation maneuver. For this, they had the same instructions for sitting up straight with good posture and maintaining a good seal around the spirometer, but this time we asked them to hyperventilate. We wanted to see um, how much air they could get in and out, um, so we had them breathe in and out as fast as they could while maintaining a good depth so we could get an accurate me measurement. We did this, um, we had them do this for only 12 seconds and then the value was extrapolated for a minute because that would be extremely hard to hyperventilate for a minute. Um, and so after this, um, this can be very hard to do like three or four times. So we had them just do it as much as they could to get um, the best assessment of their attempt. And then we moved on to a measurement of the diaphragm. So we used a portable diagnostic ultrasound machine, which was a Logic EGE, to measure the thickness of the diaphragm wall. We used an 8 to 13 megahertz linear array transducer to assess the muscle thickness, and then a curvilinear transducer to assess the muscle movement. So this top picture here, this white line, is that's the diaphragm. Just a point of reference, this is the liver. So when they came in, we would have them lay down on a table and pull up their shirt just enough and we would either do an anterior view or a mid-axillary view. 
and then we would put the transducer at either the sixth or the seventh intercostal space, and that's just the space in between each rib. From there, we could find this image most times. Um, once we got that, we would put the ultrasound machine into M mode. M mode allows us to get this view. So it just takes a slice of the diaphragm. So as you can see, it looks different. That's because, so the humps and the dips is either a contraction or a relaxation. So once we were satisfied that we had a nice clean uh, contraction and relaxation, we would freeze frame it. And then we would use calipers. So the caliper was then used to point at either the top and then the bottom of each the contraction and the relaxation to measure the thickness of the diaphragm for each patient or subject. So before we get into the results, we have to say that um, none of our findings were statistically significant, but we did still find some things that were interesting. As you can see um, with the mass group, all of their values for the pulmonary function testing had slight increases, but they decreased in all of the aerobic capacity measurements. And with the control group, all of their values were more varied and showed no real pattern. So taking a look at the mean diaphragm muscle thickness change in percentage. So we used an equation to come up with this percentage. It was thickness at the end of muscle inspiration minus a thickness at the end of muscle uh, expiration, and then divide that by the thickness at the end of muscle expiration. So what we expected to see was an increase for the post in the mask, because an increase in percentage would mean an increase in the thickness. However, as you see, that was not the case. It flipped. Um, we expected the control group to probably stay just about the same. However, they had a notable increase in thickness. So here we have a graph of the mean FEV1 versus the uh, FVC. And what this is is just a ratio between the amount of expired air in the first second versus the total amount of expired air. Um, this value in healthy individuals is typically anywhere between 70 to 85 percent. So you can see that all of our subjects were well within the average range, and we just saw a very slight increase with the mass group and a decrease within the control group. So now we are looking at the relative VO2 max. Um, again, we expected to see an increase in the mass group due to claims by the company. Um, however, each group decreased in their relative VO2 max. So something that we never really talked about looking at was a treadmill time. Um, as you can see, the mass group increased by about 50 seconds while the control group stayed about the same. They just dropped a little bit. Um, we were definitely interested in seeing if the mask has, if used for a much longer period of time, would have a significant, have significant data on endurance usage. So from our research, we concluded that the altitude simulation masks have no real benefit on cardiovascular function, respiratory muscle function, or overall endurance performance. Um, so while some of our findings um, were interesting, none of them were significant enough to deem the mask um, effective at what it claims to do. So we do have some improvements that we would have liked to have made. Um, so we did not have a standardized workout routine for our subjects. We thought that if we said you have to do what we say, we would not have enough subjects at all to even complete this because no one really wants to change their workout for eight weeks. Um, we also thought it would be a good idea to just supervise each training session just to make sure each subject was actually working out when they said they were. Um, we did pr take precautions in our study though. We texted each subject once a week um, just to say, hey, are you, are you still working out? We, now we don't know if they were lying when they said yes or no. Um, but that's just something that we thought could help us out. We'd also just like to have a larger sample size. We think that having more subjects would have created more accurate data and just given a better view of the mask. We think that having a longer duration of the study would benefit it because when, when there were slight improvements in the mask, having it go for a longer time would potentially increase those increases in data, giving hopefully potentially significant data. So we just want to thank everyone again for coming out and listening. And if anyone has any questions, we would love to take them now. Yes. Yeah. Thing to add with your standard, standardized workout regimen. That could definitely play an impact. I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, the first one is that age, age make a difference. You know, the 
hotels and they work out through a hotel section that's probably 18 to 25. Right. After you are 13, you know, 30 years old, what about after you are 50 years old? And so yeah. And then Puma. Yeah, it could. So with ours, um, our subjects range from 19 yeah. to 22, just yeah. college age. And yeah. so we were just comparing their them, them to themselves, not with each other. So, oh. mm -hmm. yes. so for this age range, um, we didn't find anything significant. Question. Kind of bouncing off of that. So let's say it wasn't such a young group. So it was maybe individuals more in their 30s or their 40s or even older. Uh, has research shown that it may be more, more beneficial in that group? None of the studies that we have looked at um, used individuals that at that age range. All of them were usually between the teens to 20. Especially for, I mean, social science, I can get a kind of 100, 200, you know, mm -hmm. uh, even third of the course. What is the kind of move? So, how they can present a result in your field that kind of shows that, hey, the sample size is good enough, but what's the mm -hmm. range or the minimum participant? Yeah. I mean, we would have loved to have a bigger sample size, yeah. but just um, with the capabilities of doing it at here at school with in the human performance lab. Mm -hmm. So do you have a criteria? Have to be 30? I think about probably 10. 10? Because, so just with doing this, so it was just Brian and I who were doing the, the VO2 max test. Each test took, I mean, depending how they how long each person ran, probably take 30 minutes to calibrate the machine, to clean it, to recalibrate for the next person. So for us as college students, just having the time, probably 10 for each, yeah. Thank you. So if you could do it again, you also look at a lot of things. Yeah. I learned from being at the town, years maybe. Are there other maybe since you had an opportunity on the grant, uh, or what are some other things that you would be interested in looking at? I think having I mean, I would definitely look at diaphragm again, just because you saw such a, a different increase in the control group compared to um, the experimental group. Also, just treadmill time, how drastically it changed. Even though it wasn't significant, it was very notable. So maybe using, creating the standardized workout routine with just endurance training and seeing how that could then help endurance athletes improve. I think it would also be interesting to look at, um, um, take samples of the blood if possible, look at um, different like oxygen levels and stuff in that, or maybe just using a pulse oximeter um, to see the oxygen saturation. That would be an interesting thing to observe. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.